I call attention this morning to two verses that I want to look at this morning, specifically verse 17. Look at verse 17 of our passage. It says, and the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And then drop down to verse 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. In Great Britain, there was an educator by the name of Principal Rainey, was what his name was. And one of the students, one of the female students that was instructed under him made the statement that she once said she believed that he went to heaven every night because he was so happy every day. That's kind of an interesting statement. This individual was so full of joy. Well, Rainey picked up on something that they did in Great Britain, that any time the king or queen would reside in one of their castles, there was a certain flag that was flown over that castle to signify that the king and the queen were in residence there. So going off that tradition of putting a flag where the royal family was, he wrote these words, and I know you'll recognize these words. This actually became the words of a song. Joy is the flag which is flown from the castle of my heart when the king is in residence there. You see, true joy comes from submitting our lives to Jesus Christ. For all practical purposes, Jesus is the king. We are his subjects. When we submit to Jesus Christ and we give all of our cares and all of our worries and concerns to him, we can experience God's peace and we can experience God's joy. Those that know God that have entrusted their lives into his care can experience the joy of the Lord. You see, happiness is dependent upon happenings but joy depends on Jesus. And so often we confuse the two, happiness versus joy. Every time you hear the word happiness, it's tied to happenings. But joy is the result of surrender to Jesus Christ. So we're looking at a section that is dealing with a short-term mission trip. It actually began in chapter 10, verses 1 through 16, in which Jesus appoints 70 disciples to go out and to share the gospel. Then in verses 17 through 24 is the 70s praise report. Now, we made mention last week as we began to look at this portion of scripture that only Luke records this ministry of the 70. It's not to be confused with chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, when Jesus appointed the 12 disciples and sent them out. This is, this is absolutely different. This is a totally different mission trip. This is 70 others, 70 disciples that Jesus appoints to go to the villages where he himself is about to go. So their ministry was really a forerunner. They were to prepare the way for Jesus Christ to go. So the section we're looking at begins in chapter 9, verse 51, and extends all the way to chapter 19, verse 27. Now, this section we're looking at is referred to as the rejection of the Son of Man. We've looked at the ministry of the Son of Man, and now the remainder of these chapters that we're going to look at deal with the rejection of of the Son of Man. Now, this section is a little different from the last section that we looked at, which was the ministry of the Son of Man. That whole section had many, many miracles that Jesus was performing in front of the people and alleviating hardships and pain. But this particular section now has more teaching than it has miracles. The last section had more miracles than it had teaching. So now the order is reversed, and over 10 times, Luke uses the phrase that Jesus was on the road. Jesus is determined to go to Jerusalem, 
So as he's heading towards Jerusalem, which is about 100 miles, along the way, Jesus is having encounters with people that have broken bodies, people that have questions, people that have concerns. So along this way, Jesus is encountering various people. He is giving instructions to his 12. He is preparing them for the cross. So here's the thought of our passage this morning. Serving the Lord results in joy with increasing knowledge and fellowship with divine satisfaction. And if I could sum up what it means to serve the Lord, that's what it means to serve the Lord. That when you and I are truly serving God, joy should be in our hearts and lives. Along with that, we're fellowshipping with him. We are growing in our knowledge of him, and we are finding a satisfied life. It's a real satisfaction to serve the Lord. And that's what we'll see as we look at this passage this morning before us. Now, here's how I want to break it down. Just two areas. In verses 17 to 20 is rejoice in this. Jesus tells us what we should rejoice in. There's nothing wrong with rejoicing and what God has done. We should do that. But there is a, a greater reason to rejoice. And then in verses 21 through 24 is divine satisfaction. Jesus makes it clear that these disciples are blessed because God is giving revelation to them. God is giving insight to them. We are the most blessed people that have a relationship with God. We are a blessed people because God is revealing himself to us. So let's pick it up here in verse 17, and let's look at this rejoice in this. And again, Saturday night, Sunday morning, ccrialto.com. If you go to the website, the notes are there on the website. The notes are on the app. If you got the app right now, you go to this week, you click on Sunday, and there's four pages of notes that we're going to put up on the screen this morning. I think printing the notes out, I think by far is the way to go. You know, you print them out, and then you put them in a binder, and then when you show up, you start with four pages of notes. You, you, you basically have the skeleton with you as you come in, and then as we begin to work through it and God speaks to us, you can jot things down as to what the Lord is saying to us and to our hearts this morning. So let's look here at verse 17. It says here, The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So it mentions the 70 return. What is the context? Well, we looked last time, and in the first 16 verses, we see that Jesus Christ appointed 70 others to go on a short-term mission trip. If you go back to chapter 10, verse 1, it gives us the setting of this. And after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. So in the first 12 verses, he tells us that their work was to prepare the way for the Messiah. Jesus was going to be heading 100 miles south, so he raised up 70 disciples that would go into each one of these villages and various towns, and they would prepare the way for Jesus to come. This was the very thing that John the Baptist did. John the Baptist prepared the way. The Bible calls him a forerunner. And a forerunner was a person that ran before the messenger of the king. He would prepare the way and then would announce then that the king was coming. So this is what these disciples were to do. Now, Jesus gave them very strict instructions. You're not to bring an extra pair of shoes. You're not to bring money with you. You're not to bring a baking bag with you. You're not to do any of these things. Your dependence is to be upon the Lord. You are to trust in me. So this was very, very important. This is what God wanted them to learn. And so they were to go to prepare the way. And so the disciples did so, and then in verses 13 through 16, then he gives this very, very stern warning to them. It's a very, very stern warning. He goes on to describe some Gentile cities, Sidon, Tyre. He mentions Sodom and Gomorrah. These were all Gentile cities that had rejected God, had rejected his people, and God had judged them severely. 
So based upon that, he goes on to mention Jewish cities. He mentions Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. And he basically says, if you think God judged the Gentiles severely, you have not seen anything yet. Those Jewish cities that reject the Messiah, that want nothing to do with the Messiah, and those that have been given much witness of the Messiah, they're going to be unrecognizable. And really, to this day, we kind of think we found Bethsaida. Bethsaida, during Christ's day, was believed to be a large community. We think we found some ruins. We're not really sure. Chorazin, we don't even know where Chorazin is. And of course, Capernaum, all Capernaum has left is a section like these pews is about the area of Capernaum. That's all that's left. So God was, was true to his word. Those that rejected Jesus, rejected the opportunity to know the Messiah, were judged by him. Notice verse 16, and notice the statement that he makes. He says, the one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. So with that as the backdrop, verse 17 records their joyful return. It says, and the 70 returned. Now another way of saying this is, they came back and gathered around Jesus. Now there's a lot here we don't know. First of all, how long was this mission trip? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. The only one that records this is Luke. So all the information on the 70 is, is contained in these 24 verses. We don't know anything beyond this. This is all we know, so we don't know how long it was. Now, we do know that Jesus has three to four months before he'll go to the cross. So we do have kind of a time frame in there, three to four months. Maybe it was a month. Maybe it was two months. Maybe it was a little longer. And then also they came and they met with Jesus. They gathered around Jesus. Obviously, there was a location that Jesus had told the disciples that after your mission is complete, let's meet at this location. Let's gather together at this location and we'll have a debriefing. We'll, we'll look over what was accomplished during your short mission trip. So it says here that they returned with joy. I love that. Because I think that, that that, in a sense, just absolutely capsulizes what ministry is. Ministry produces joy. It is a joy to serve the Lord. I got to tell you, I don't know what I would do with my life if I could not serve him. I, there really, for me, there would be no purpose to life itself without serving the Lord. I, I believed I was saved to serve. And a pastor once said that, and it stuck with me. And I don't understand when people know Jesus and they're not serving him. They do not know what they are missing. I was thinking about this joy of service, and I thought about a, this weird little event that happened a number of years ago. I was sitting in the front yard of my house, and I was reading a book. And this neighbor walks across the street and comes up to me, and she says, I felt like God was saying to stop here, and you could help me. That's what she said to me. And I thought, well, no, be the other neighbor next door. That's not me. <laughs> no, but I thought, okay. And I said, what's going on? So she starts sharing about her marriage and all these things that are going on. And so right then and there, I, I stopped what I was doing, and I was able to pray with this woman. I was able, I had an extra Bible. I was able to give her a Bible. And when she left, I was, you talk about joy. You know, to think that God would speak to someone to tell them to come talk to me because I was going to share with them God's word. That is amazing when you think of God and his plan. Now, I know that that's, that's one little example. That's a small example. And there any of us here that have walked with Jesus for any length of time can give many, many stories about specific encounters we have where God led us to speak to an individual or an individual was led by God to speak to us and how God worked in us and through us. But that's what ministry is all about. It's about God using us. It's about God 
being a blessing through us to other people. And that's the joy that this 70 had. They were filled with joy. Notice the reporting of success. Notice what they said. They were saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now, that's kind of interesting that they would say that. Because if you go back to verse 9, the Lord gave them authority to heal sickness and disease, but he said nothing about casting out demons. So what happened here was God went beyond what he even said he would do. So God went beyond it. It was beyond their own imaginations, beyond what the Lord had even promised them. They thought they were going to go out and they were going to heal people, and no doubt they did so, but it went beyond them. God granted to them authority to cast out demons. And you find this in ministry, that in ministry, God goes beyond our expectations. He always does. He always goes beyond. I mean, you're involved in vacation Bible school. You're involved in the ushers ministry. You're teaching children's ministry. You know, you're serving in security. Wherever you might be in this church and you're serving, God always blesses us beyond. I always feel like I'm, I'm more blessed giving out than when I receive from others or from the Lord. I, 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 I just am so blessed that, that the Lord would use me. I'm so blessed that I get to represent him and serve him. And so it is such a tremendous blessing. So they're absolutely elated over what the Lord has done. So look at verse 18. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now notice this statement. And he said to them. So now here in verses 18, 19, and 20, there are three statements that Jesus makes to his disciples in response to the joy of service. And I, I hope you'll write these three things down that we're about to look at. I think they're significant, and I think they have application to us. So there are three things that Jesus says in response to their joy over how God has used them. The first one is in verse 18. He says, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. So what Jesus is referring to, a scene that he saw where Satan was overthrown. Notice he refers to the devil as Satan, which means slander is what it means. This is not this picture between light and darkness. You know, it's not an allegory. Satan and Lucifer are, was a real being. He originally was Lucifer, a very high-ranking angel that was lifted up in pride and was brought down because of pride. He later on became known as Satan. And so... He describes the scene of having watched Satan uh, through the ministry of the 70 fall. Notice what he says. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Why lightning? Well, lightning depicts power of a dazzling brilliance that suddenly is snuffed out. So what Jesus is describing that through the ministry of the 70, Satan was snuffed out. He was like this bright flash in the pan. He was bright, he was powerful, but it all went away, it all diminished. And I believe that what Jesus is describing here is a scene that he saw. That as he watched the 70 go out, and he watched them healing diseases, as he watched them casting out demons, what he basically saw was Satan was dethroned by the 70. He saw God's kingdom coming to earth, and he saw Satan being extinguished like almost a boltning, a light of, bolt, of, of lightning that would just flash and would disappear. I love this in Ephesians 6.12. It says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. I think sometimes Satan dupes us. We get into flesh and blood battles. 
Maybe our children act up and we go, I'm going to beat the devil out of you right now. You know, that's what we think, you know. But let me just say, there's nothing wrong with corporal punishment, spanking our children. I think we should. But if we neglect praying with them and instructing them in right and wrong, we're missing out. We're looking at it as simply a flesh and blood battle, but it's not. It's, it, it, it is a demonic. It is one of temptation. It is one of rebellion against God. And we've got to see it for what it is. It's, it's a spiritual battle. So I think that, that this first example that Jesus gives here of Satan falling, I think it's describing the seventy. But Satan's fall is mentioned four different ways in Scripture, and I want to mention these to you real briefly. The next fall, of course, is, is when he was thrown from heaven, when Satan rebelled against the Lord. Notice the wording here, I was watching Satan. He does not say it is written. He says, I was watching. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 says these words and how you have fallen from heaven O star of the morning son of the dawn you have been cut down to the earth you who weakened the nations Ezekiel 28 also describes Satan prior to the creation of man being thrown down from heaven so it describes this rebellion that happened before man was even created, and Jesus saw it. It's not it was written, he said, I was watching. Now what this reveals to us is the eternality of the Son of God, that Jesus existed prior to Bethlehem. Some people like to think that God showed up in Bethlehem, but he always existed. Jesus was called the Son of God, and he existed prior to Bethlehem. Matter of fact, he witnessed Satan being cast down from heaven when he rebels. There's also another time that Satan is going to be cast down. Satan's future fall will be in the middle of the tribulation. If you're taking notes, jot down Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. In this, it gives us great insight. Did you know that Satan has access to heaven? The Bible calls him the false accuser of the brethren. That the Bible says day and night, Satan appears before God, accusing the followers of the Lord. Well, in the middle of the tribulation, God gets so sick and tired of Satan slandering the saints that he literally kicks Satan out of heaven and throws him down to earth. And you can read about it in Revelation 12. When he does so, all of heaven erupts into worship and praise. All of heaven is worshiping God for finally throwing Satan down to the earth. But then he says, but woe to the earth. Satan realizes he only has three and a half years to work. And he's got to do all of his work in the, the remaining three and a half years of the tribulation. But there's one more time and one final time that Satan will be thrown down. And that final one is in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. This is the final ousting of Satan, the final fall of Satan, Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So there really is four different times in which the devil is reported to have fallen. The one that I think Jesus is talking about here is the one in which he's been dethroned through the ministry of the 70, that the 70 has put a dent into Satan's program is literally what's happened. This brings us to the second statement of Jesus in verse 19. Success was through his power. The success of the 70 was not due to the 70. It was due to the Lord. The Lord was the one that was working in and through the 70. Notice it says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, 
and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Now, these terms for serpent and scorpion, these are all terms that are used interchangeably for Satan and his followers and his demons are just terms that are used interchangeably. And he says, behold, I have given you authority. Now, authority is not only power, but it is the right to exercise authority. So that's what he's referring to. So when he says that God has granted them authority, he not only gave them power, but he gave them the authority to exercise the power. Say, you leave church this morning and you're ripping down the 210 to 85, the flow of traffic, and you get pulled over, you know, for speeding. Do you know that that CHP has the power and has been granted authority to make your insurance rates go up? Did you know that? No, no, he's going to write you a ticket is what he's going to do. And he's going to cite you for that. He has the power and has the authority to write a ticket. He has the power and the authority. And what Jesus is describing here is the power and the right to act has been given to his followers, is what he is describing here. He says to tread on serpents and scorpions, which is a depiction of Satan and his demons. Now this, of course, was foretold all the way back in Genesis 3.15. Listen to this in Genesis. This is the very first promise of the Messiah is in Genesis 3.15, the promise that Jesus would be victorious over Satan. Listen to these words. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head, that's capital H, which, which is a reference to Jesus Christ. The seed of the woman would be the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would bruise the head of Satan, the serpent, and you, the serpent, shall bruise his heel. So when did this happen? This happened at the cross. Satan bruised the heel of Jesus by having Jesus nailed to a cross and buried in a tomb. But on the third day, Jesus stood on his head and bruised his head when he rose from the grave on the third day. So yes, there was a bruising of the heel of the Messiah, but there was victory where Jesus stood on the serpent's head. Now, because Jesus did this, he is able to grant that authority to those that follow him. Those that follow Jesus have been granted that authority. Psalm 91.13 says, You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Now notice this statement here at the end of verse 19. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. So the child of God is protected by the power of Jesus Christ. Nothing can touch us outside of his permission. Now I want you to think about that this morning. Sometimes we say, God, I don't get it. And, and there's nothing wrong with saying that. I don't, I don't understand when God allows things, but I still know that God allows things. Nothing happens in the life of the believer by accident. Nothing happens by coincidence in the life of the Christian. Everything that happens in our life is by the hand of the Lord. The Lord allows it to take place because God has a purpose and a plan. There's the old saying that says, Satan throws us in the furnace, but God keeps his hand on the thermostat. And that's true. That's absolutely true. We may be thrown into the fire like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But notice when those three Hebrews were thrown into the fire, notice who joined them. The Lord was with them in the fire. He joined them. He was in control. So no matter what's taking place in my life this morning, if I'm a child of God, it is working for my good and for God's glory. Nothing touches me outside of his permission. And we need to know that this morning. Now, that will help us when we go through those times in which we don't understand. We can trust in the fact 
that he says here, and over all power and of the enemy, nothing will injure you. Keep that in mind when you go through a difficult time. So this brings us to number three in verse 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. So number three in verse 20 is the joy of salvation. That is where our true joy comes from, is the joy of salvation. It's not the joy of ministry, though that is joyful. The deepest joy and the most profound joy is the joy of our salvation. Notice he says in verse 20, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Now, why does he say this? Because success can lead to pride. It's a very, very slippery slope. In ministry, when God uses us, God help us if we start thinking it's us. God help us if we start taking credit for what God has done or what God is doing. I find it interesting that when Paul left behind Timothy to set the church in order there in Ephesus, in 1 Timothy 3, 6, he describes how to choose leaders, and he makes this interesting observation. He says, and not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into condemnation incurred by the devil. So there's a tendency that when we're young in the Lord, we can be lifted up in ourselves. We can become conceited. We can become prideful and start to think that it was us, that we're the ones that did it. I love this saying by D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody used to say, if you can explain it, God didn't do it. Isn't that a great quote? If you can explain it, God didn't do it. And there's a lot of truth to that. We start going, well, you know, I went to this school, and I was underneath this ministry, and they taught me how to do this. And, you know, I've always been kind of a people person. Those are all just excuses in which somehow we're trying to take credit for what the Lord has done. Success can appear to be genuine grace. I think we see a lot of this today with the user-friendly movement where, you know, you have skits during the service, you have fog machines, you got all this stuff where they make the church look like a nightclub or something, you know. And they, you know, it's just... And so you got... The pastor gets up there and he tells a story about the person that that their dog's been gone for 15 years, and they heard a scratching at the door, and the dog shows up, and the whole congregation cries. You know, oh, this is such a, a heartwarming story. Who else needs Jesus? Come forward to receive Jesus. So they tell this story, or they show a video of a person rescuing a, a dog, you know, from a, from a burning house, and people weep and cry and all this. And a lot of this is just manipulation is all it is. It's not necessarily God-working. It's a dangerous thing. You can pull at people's heartstrings. You can do that. I've seen pastors pull at people's heartstrings. And just because you get someone to come forward doesn't mean it's a genuine work of grace. It could be manipulation. It could be a lot of the flesh and God's working in spite of us, which he often does. But success can also bring a false sense of superiority, especially if we have a background of education and maybe we've, we've gone and got a degree and such, and, and we look back on that and we say, well, you know, if it hadn't been for this degree, I wouldn't have a church this size or I wouldn't have been able to build this or I wouldn't have been able to accomplish this. And, and what we're doing is we're taking credit again for something that the Lord has done. But success is also something that necessarily doesn't last. We can be successful or see fruit for a time, and then all of a sudden that time ends. So it's a foolish thing to have all of our joy based upon the accomplishments of ministry. 
thinking about all the ways that God has used us. But notice here, the root of our joy is found in a living relationship with God. Notice what he says here. But rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Now what he does is he pulls an Old Testament description of various cities and villages back in the Old Testament. That when a person was a citizen of a certain city, they could be entered on the roll of that city, and being on the roll of that city entitles them to certain privileges as a citizen of that city. So if you're a citizen of that city, you would have the right to vote because your name is on the roll and you are identified as a privileged citizen of that community. So what happened as time went on, the Bible adapted that illustration to describe those whose names were recorded in heaven. Those whose names were on the roll of heaven. Those that were the righteous. Those that belong to the city of God. Now here's a few instances of this. Moses uses this in Exodus chapter 32, verse 32. He says, but now if you will forgive their sin, if not, please blot out your, out of your book which you have written. Psalm 69, 28, may they be blotted out of the book of life and may they not be recorded with all the righteous. Revelation 3, 5, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. So it became really an illustration of those that belong to the Lord. They put their faith in God. They are counted as righteous. Their citizenship is in heaven. Their name's on heaven's roll, and they belong to the world. So Jesus says, what you need to rejoice about is the fact that your name is on heaven's roll. You need to rejoice that you've been counted righteous. That you've been counted right before God. That's what you need to rejoice about. But rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. So the focus is not our accomplishments, but what God has saved us. The eternal security that comes from being born again, being the property of Jesus Christ, belonging to the Lord, that's what we should be rejoicing about. And I hope that every one of us here this morning are ever rejoicing that you've been forgiven of your sins, that your name is recorded in heaven, that God looks at you as being righteous through the works of Jesus, the righteousness of Christ in us. I hope that that's something that puts a smile on your face. I hope that you never lose sight and, and never lose the joy that comes from our salvation, realizing that our names have been recorded in heaven. And so this brings us now to verses 21 through 24, and this is that divine satisfaction. So notice verse 21. And at that time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, Jesus rejoiced over God's revelation. Now, I want us to notice this. This is really unique. This is super important because this only is recorded in Luke, and it's only recorded here. This is a very unique passage that we're about to look at, and I'm sure it will touch your heart. It touched my heart this week as I was studying it. He says, and at that very time, he rejoiced greatly, or quite literally, Jesus was thrilled with joy. He was thrilled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, why was Jesus thrilled with joy? Why did Jesus have thrill and joy in his countenance upon his face? Go back to verse 20, and it tells us why. It says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. 
Now this week, I, I've, been, I've been going through about probably 20 different commentaries as I've been studying the Gospel of Luke. You know, I, I, I taught the Gospel of Luke about 19 years ago. And so this time as I'm restudying Luke and going through Luke and really slowing it down, I'm reading books that I've never read before because I feel like if I'm not excited about the book, you won't be either. And if I'm not growing and learning from Luke, I don't expect you to grow or learn from Luke either. And so I'm reading this, this new commentary that I've never read before, and it's by a pastor named Ivor Powell, is his name, Ivor Powell, and he has a commentary entitled Luke's Thrilling Gospel. And it's kind of an interesting series that he has in the Gospels. He, he, he writes it as a pastor is writing to disciples. He says, this commentary is going to be a little different from other commentaries because I, I really want to talk to the disciples of Jesus and I want to talk about ministry and I want to focus on ministry. So as I'm interpreting this, I'm interpreting it from a standpoint of, of, of a pastor, of, 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 of disciples serving God, about being a servant of God is really what his main focus is. And so... Ivor Powell says these words regarding this verse. He says, this verse is remarkable for it mentions the only occasion when Jesus is said to rejoice. So this is the only time in all four Gospels that it records that Jesus rejoiced. There's only one time in all four Gospels and this is the very place that it mentions that he rejoiced. The evangelists were careful to tell us that he wept at Nain, he wept at Jerusalem, and he wept at the Garden of Gethsemane. Yet in no other place do we read of the Lord rejoicing. The New English Bible translates, and at this moment, Jesus exalted in the Holy Spirit. So the Lord was thrilled, the great heart was overwhelmed with happiness, his face radiated joy, his soul was exultant, and why? He had just heard of the deliverance of precious souls. So why did Jesus Christ have this joy coming through him? Why was his face glowing and radiating with joy? Because he just mentioned that names have been recorded in heaven. That salvation has taken place with his disciples. And I believe this morning, it's no different. When a sinner is saved and a sinner's name is recorded in the roll of heaven, Jesus rejoices. There is not a time in which Jesus is more joyful and, and, and is more exuberant and, is, and has the shine of, of literally the sun upon his face is when salvation has taken place. God loves to see the lost found. And that's what he's rejoicing about. In verses 21 and 22 is a prayer of thanksgiving. So Jesus now launches into a prayer that he prays publicly. He, he prays this prayer out loud. And he said, I praise you, O Father. So the revelation of lost souls being saved has put a smile and put a joy in the heart of the Savior. But I want to call attention to something. If you go back to verse 23, I want us to note something in verse 23, and this will help us to understand this prayer. In verse 23, it says, turning to the disciples, he said, he said privately. So this prayer that we're now looking at here in verses 21 and 22 was a prayer that Jesus prayed out loud. This was an audible prayer. It was a prayer, but it was words of praise to the Father, words of praise to what the Holy Spirit was doing. So it was a prayer that was prayed out loud. There's a time in which our prayers are to be public. There's nothing wrong with praying prayers out loud. As long as we're praying from our hearts and we're, we're praising God, we're glorifying God, not glorifying and honoring ourselves. And so he says, Lord of heaven and earth. So notice that he's describing God as the creator. 
I love Genesis when it describes in the first two chapters the creation of heaven and earth. It simply starts with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's all it says. So God doesn't go on for the next two chapters trying to persuade whoever will read the Bible that he's real. He doesn't do that. He just simply says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. It'd be kind of like if I wrote an autobiography, I would spend two chapters trying to prove that I really lived. That's, 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 that's nonsense. That's, it's, it's, it's craziness. So here he just simply refers to the true God as the Lord of heaven and earth. And he goes on to say that you have hidden these things. Now, what things is he referring to? He's referring to verses 17 through 20. What are those things? Satan's fall. He just disclosed to them that he saw Satan fall through the ministry of the 70. He spoke about the success that they had was due to his power. He told them that the reason they were successful is he had given them the power. And then he's rejoicing that they're saved and their names are recorded. Now, those are the things that are hidden from the wise. Now, who are the wise? The wise are the religious that know everything and consequently learn nothing. They think they have God all sewed up in a, in a convenient bag. They know everything about God. They can, they can quote the Old Testament. They can memorize the first five books of the Old Testament, the law. They can expound on the purpose of the law and the meaning of the law. They can go on and on and on. But they don't really need God's insight because they already have it. They already have it all. And so these are the theologians. These are what we would call those that have wisdom. These are the wise ones. They, they have all of this wisdom that they've derived from themselves, not from heaven, but from their own minds, from their own learning, from their own memorization. It's what they have come to the conclusion of. They're not open to what God would share with them. And then notice he says the intelligent. These are those with insight. Those that have mental power that may be great, yet they meet with moral failure. Now, when the Bible contrasts those that have wisdom and those that are intelligent, the Bible is not doing a comparison between the educated and uneducated. Now, I don't want anyone to think that, because sometimes I hear people do this, and we, I think sometimes in the church we minimize you know, a degree and so forth, and we think, ah, you know, you don't really don't need that per se. There's nothing wrong with those things. But God help us if we're trusting in those and we're not trusting in the Lord. That's where the danger comes in. So he's not contrasting the educated versus the uneducated. What he is contrasting is those that are humble to receive from the Lord. Those that will humble themselves and say, God, instruct me. I want to know. I want to understand. I want to learn. So what he's doing is he's contrasting the religious, the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees versus the disciples who were like little babes that, that have their mouths open, wanting to be fed by God, wanting to understand the things of the Lord. So it's really a contrast between the two. And so Jesus here is praising his Father for revealing his truth to infants. Notice he says, and have revealed them to infants. Who are the infants? The disciples. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were the common people. Jesus even compared them to children. He says, unless you become a child, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. Why a child? Because a child will accept help. A child will admit that they can't do it. A child will take instruction. But the religious wanted nothing to do with what Jesus had to say and what his followers had to say. Here's a good example in Acts chapter 4, verses 13, we have an instance where John and Peter were standing before the council in Jerusalem. Listen to these words. And it, and it says, And they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. 
And they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. So here were men that had not been to their rabbinical schools, had not been trained by the priests, but they had this incredible wisdom, and the wisdom was the result of being with Jesus. They were teachable. This is not talking about the school. It's talking about the heart, the heart that's receptive and being open to be taught. Turn over to 1 Corinthians one let Let's read this for ourselves. When we were going through Corinthians, Paul was contrasting the wisdom of the Lord versus the wisdom of the world. And those that are educated often trust in their education. Those that have learned certain things lean on what they've learned. They're not teachable. They're not open to what God would say. So look at this in 1 Corinthians 1.26. Paul says, For consider your calling, brethren. There were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. The base things of the world and the despised, God has chosen the things that are not so that he might nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. So the truth is that Jesus alone is the truth. That's the truth. And that's the very thing they rejected. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes unto the Father but by me. So, okay, let's look at an example. Who were the first to testify of the birth of the Son of God? Was it the priest? Was it the Pharisees? Was it the theologians? No, it was shepherds. That's who the testimony came from. Shepherds weren't even considered worthy to testify in a court of law. They were considered the dregs of society. And who should God choose but those that were humble, that were teachable? God says, you know what? You'll be the first witnesses of the birth of the Son of God. And Luke chapter 2 records these humble, humble, God-fearing shepherds that were so blown away by what God revealed to them. Here's secular delusion, and this is alive and well in 2021. I'm not perfect, but I'm certainly better than. That's a classic 2021. Oh, I'm not perfect. But I can tell you this, I'm better than that person. I'm better than these people. Jesus even told a story regarding this. If you go over to Luke 18.10, we'll just read a couple verses here. Jesus even mentioned this in a story that he told. In Luke 18.10, two men went up into the temple to pray, and one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like that tax collector. And it kind of makes you wonder if he pointed at him. There was that finger, you know, pointing at that tax collector. I thank you, God, I'm not a sinner like him, you know, and points over at him. I fast twice a week. I pay my tithes to all that I get. So this is one of the great delusions in 2021. I'm not perfect, but I'm better than. Well, let me tell you, God doesn't judge on the curve, by the way. That isn't how he judges. He judges based upon perfection, which is Jesus Christ. That's the standard, not me, not you. Here's another one, salvation by association. Salvation by association. Who is following Christianity? Who has been converted to Christianity? If Christianity is real, if Jesus is God, what great people of our age have become Christians? I don't see Bill Gates trusting in Jesus. I, I, I don't 
I don't see Jeff Bezos trusting in Jesus. Elon Musk, I don't see any of these, these great shakers and movers. If Jesus is real, if he's the son of God, if salvation is genuine, if salvation is real, why aren't the shakers and the movers converted to Christianity? As if they're the standard of righteousness. As if they're the standard of what is right and wrong. And then also there is the delusion of superior knowledge gives spiritual advantage. You know, and you see this a lot in the cults. You see it a lot in religion. You have, you have people in religion that focus on certain little teachings that they have. For instance, Seventh-day Adventists, of course, focus on keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the big deal. Then along with the Sabbath is eating no meat at all. So these are kind of their major thrusts, and they've done a lot of research, they've done a lot of study, and they can quote all sorts of verses out of Exodus, out of Leviticus verses, the Sabbath as the day to worship. They can quote what's clean, what's unclean. You know what's amazing about all of that? Is that the law also says you should never shave. Now that's interesting. But how many Seventh-day Adventists use a razor? They shouldn't be using a razor because that's in the law too. You should never trim your beard. You should leave your beard alone. And that includes women with beards too. They can grow theirs out too. And so that's part of it too. I don't know where that came from. It was just there, you know, it was like there. But again, you know, the Bible is very clear on these things. Very, very clear. You want to go by the law, then you obey the whole law. But instead, they focus on worshiping on the Sabbath. They focus on not eating meat. And they major on all of those. And in the process, they fail to understand the Bible. They don't understand the Bible. But oh, they know those two areas. They can quote the verses, and they can say them over and over and over again. So Jesus says, yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. So Jesus was just blown away that God the Father gave it to the humble, those that wanted it, those that had a heart to understand, and he just bypassed the seminary. He bypassed the rabbinical schools. He bypassed the priesthood and went right to that common, everyday people. And Jesus says, I am rejoicing over this. Those that are hungry, you're feeding. Those that want to know, they're learning. And that's what I am pleased with. So verse 22, Jesus witness. Notice he says in verse 22, all things, this is all inclusive, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. Now, I would underline this in my Bible. If you're taking notes, you got a pen, and you got your Bible open. But what other verse do you want to prove that Jesus claims deity? I mean, what more do you need? I mean, I have people, oh, I've never seen in the Bible where Jesus declares himself to be God. He just says all authority has been given to him as the Son of God. I mean, what more do you need? He's claiming to be deity. He's claiming to be the Son of God. He is claiming to have all authority handed over to him by the Father himself. And knowing who Jesus is, is the great dividing line. We have what is called today, and I'm going to use the term, Christian cults. And the reason they're called Christian cults is because they are cults that have stripped Jesus Christ of his divinity or his deity. And they use the same terminology that we use, that I'm using this morning, but they use a different dictionary. So they use the same words, they use the same terms that I'm using, but they use a different dictionary in defining what they are. And I'm talking about Mormons. I'm talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm talking about Masons. I'm talking about Christian science. There's neither Christian nor science. That's what I'm talking about. And so they'll use terms like Jesus died on the cross. Jesus was resurrected. And I'll tell you, Jehovah's Witnesses, they're some of the trickiest folks to deal with. Because do you know that they're allowed to lie to you? They actually are permitted to lie to you. 
They have a teaching called theocratic warfare where the end justifies the means. So if they have to lie to you in order to convince you, in order for you to become a convert to Jehovah's Witnesses, they are justified in withholding the truth from you. The Bible tells us in 1 John that no truth is of a lie. That's what the Bible says. But they supersede Scripture. So when they come to your house, they come up Saturday with their briefcases, a whole family comes up to the door and they say, you know, we would like to study the Bible. You know what your question is so simple. You just look them right in the eye and say, who is Jesus Christ? Just ask them, who is Jesus Christ? And I'll tell you right now, if they're Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe he's a creature. That's who they believe. If, if, if they are Mormons, they believe he's an angel. They believe that we're gods, little g, gods. That's what they believe. So that's really, you know, it, it, you know if you're Islam, he's a prophet. But that's the million-dollar question, who is Jesus Christ? That's the question. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And that's really the heart of the whole issue. Who is Jesus Christ? Here he is declaring himself to be the Son of God. Notice Jesus' relationship to the Father was exclusive. Because in this verse, three times, he refers to himself as the Son, capital S. He is claiming to be deity. He is claiming to be the exclusive Son of God. I am the only exclusive Son of God. God the Father is my Father. I am God as God the Father is God. That's what Jesus Christ is claiming. Philippians 2.6 says, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. It's hard to grasp. It's hard to understand. But the Bible declares it, and the Bible says it. Jesus is the source of revelation. Notice this. And to anyone whom the Son wills to reveal him. So the only way that anyone ever comes to a realization who Jesus is and who the Father is is because Jesus is drawing them. Jesus is allowing it. No one comes to salvation on their own. It is the work of God. It is the work of the Spirit of God. It is the work of the Son of God. It is the work of God the Father. All three are, are participating in our salvation. It is God the Father that devised the plan. It's Jesus Christ that carried it out. And it's the Holy Spirit that draws us to salvation. No one comes unto, to the Father except through the Son. And that's what Jesus said. So to be wrong about Jesus is to be wrong about God. So you got Jehovah's Witnesses that reject Jesus. They look at Jesus as a creature and they go, we reject the creature, we believe in God. Well, they don't know God. Because Jesus is not a creature, he is God. So they don't know God. You got Islam, he's a prophet. No, he's not a prophet. He's the son of God. That's what he is. You got the Mormons, you know, he's an angel. No, he's not an angel. He created angels. He's not an angel. He's God himself. Listen to these words in John 5, 22. For not even the father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the son. So that all who honor the Son, even as they honor the Father, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. So now verses 23 and 24, Jesus is blessing. Notice this. Verse 23, turning to the disciples, he said privately. So I think now this prayer stops. He now looks at the 12 and he says, blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. Oh, of all the privileges to be able to see the son of God in action, to hear with our own ears the words of Jesus, the words of God. Oh, of all the privileges that have been given to man. Surely this is one of the greatest. There they were literally hearing God speak. There they were watching God act. 
And they were witnesses of it. Verse 24, for I say to you that many prophets and kings wish to see the things which you see. If you're taking notes, jot down 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. You know what Peter tells us? That as the prophets were writing the scriptures, they didn't even understand it. Check that out. As they were giving a prophecy, they didn't even understand it. God was coming through them, and he's saying to the disciples, you don't know how privileged you are. I mean, there are kings. King David longed to see my face. They long, Isaiah longed to hear me speak. And you have that, and they did not see them, and hear the things which you hear, and did not hear them. See, Jesus is encouraging the disciples, saying, listen, oh, don't neglect what you're hearing right now. Don't neglect what you're seeing right now. You are the most privileged of all people. I want to close this morning with just two thoughts. I want to look at those two areas that we just looked at real quickly. Number one, we should be grateful and joyful that God can and does use us. The greatest joy results from the realization that God has given us salvation. Our names are written on heaven's roll. Surely that should put joy in our hearts more than even serving the Lord. Secondly, God's ways are not man's ways. God is available to the child, but can't be found by the intellectual. God is revealed to those with childlike spirit, which is displayed in humility, wonder, reverence, and trust. Let me ask you this morning, will you come to the Lord as a child? Will you humble yourself and say, Lord, please teach me? Please show me your ways. I want to know you. I want to know your ways. I want to serve you. I want to resemble you. Please show me. Show me, show me your ways. Maybe you're not serving this morning, and you would be honest and say, Lord, please make me a servant. I want to serve. I want to know the joy of service, but if I have the joy of salvation, I also want to know the joy of service. 